for all those of us who are who uh, just logged on, uh, let's uh, open up our Bibles uh, to First uh, Samuel chapter eleven. Um, we're going to be going try to go over chapters eleven through fifteen, potentially get into sixteen uh, here this evening, but we'll see how it goes. Hope everybody's enjoying this beautiful weather that we have. Uh, it's, I tell you what, it's nice being outside and uh, have a t-shirt on and. Uh, being able to enjoy this beautiful sunshine and another day that God created and just uh, has blessed us with. So hopefully you're able to get outside a little bit after work and enjoy some of that sunshine. But as we get ready for our study here tonight, uh, we're going to just do uh, pick up in chapter 11. Uh, we've pretty much finished chapter 11 last week, but I just want to kind of touch on where we left off because uh, actually two weeks ago, because last week I, I broke a tooth. So uh, so it's been a couple of weeks. So let's just kind of refresh our memory where we left off in chapter 11. Uh, in chapter 11, really, we see several things. Uh, the Israelites are they're uh, still they're still lacking in faith. Uh, you know, big shocker there, right? After coming out of Judges, that the Israelites can lack faith from time to time. But here in chapter 11, we see that they're still lacking in faith, and uh, as evidenced by the beginning of the chapter, we see that. Uh, and God has to send His Holy Spirit upon Saul, uh, and the Holy Spirit empowers Saul. It gives Saul courage that he needs uh, during uh, for this battle coming up against the Ammonites. Uh, it also gives him wisdom and, and gives him the determination that he needs uh, in order to defeat the Ammonites. And so uh, we, when you look at uh, this is the second time that God has uh, sent the power of the Holy Spirit upon Saul. Uh, the first time we've seen was back in, uh, in the preacher. Then next we see warning all of Israel. And Saul has to give a warning because he's not, he hasn't been fully made the king yet uh, by the people. God has, uh, uh, has made him king uh, in, in his sight. Uh, he was um, uh, consecrated uh, for, for, this, for this work as king. But we see that, uh, that Saul's about to give a warning to all of Israel in this chapter. And, uh, and he gives a warning about what will happen to any of the men who refuse to come out and to fight alongside the, the, their fellow brethren in Israel. And so as they go up against the Ammonites. And so as you look at this, uh, this information, notice what he says in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 7 and 8 there that's on your screen. It says that Saul took a, a yoke of oxen. He cut them into pieces. And he did this because he wanted to send, he sent the, those pieces throughout Israel by the hand of messengers saying, whoever does not come out after Saul uh, and, after, and, and, and after Samuel, so it shall be done to his oxen, uh, that the dread of the Lord fell on the people and they came out as one man. And he numbered them in Bezek and the sons of Israel were about 300,000. We know that it says that uh, uh, the sons of Judah were 30,000. So when you think about this number of 330,000, uh, that's a far cry short of what uh, of, of the men uh, and the people that would have came up out of Israel, because just the men were counted uh, that came up out of, Is or came up out of uh, Egypt. And it was over 600,000 men. We know that uh, uh, that if you kind of figure average uh, like a family of three, there would have probably been at least a million and a half people, um, uh, 1.8 million uh, to 2 million people that came up out of Egypt. And now the men are dwindled down to 330,000. And so uh, years of idolatry and years of oppression uh, have taken its toll on Israel. And remember, the time of judges lasted about three, a little over 300 years. And so uh, like I said, those years of idolatry and sin and oppression uh, that God allowed the people of Israel to be oppressed uh, had taken its toll on the number of people that were be, uh, available to, to come alongside uh, their brethren to fight uh, under this uh, new monarchy that's about to get established here in this next chapter. Uh, there was a certain number of, of people that when you look at it, uh, when, when they thought about Saul, they originally rejected Saul uh, and they spoke out against Saul. And now the people, uh, these people, uh, uh, the Jews, uh, they want to know who they were that spoke out against Saul as they're getting ready to make him king. And they're, for, they're formally going to, uh, to, to ratify Saul as king of, uh, uh, over all the nation and all, over all the tribes of Israel. Uh, but Saul, uh, after the victory over the Ammonites in chapter 11, he says, uh, no, we're not putting anybody to death because the Lord, this is the, uh, the, the day for the Lord. The Lord had delivered us uh, from the hands of the Ammonites. And we know uh, that God was with us, that God fought for us and that God had strengthened us. Uh, when we were weak and gave us courage when we were uh, fearful. And so he says, there will be nobody being put to death this day. Uh, instead, 
Uh, we're all, we, we're going to come together as one nation, uh, and we're going to come together under one nation under the monarchy. And so Saul's reign as king officially had begun, uh, and his reign and his hold of, of the reign of power uh, is officially his. And so God uh, allows the people to have what exactly what they asked for, and that is a king. And so what do we see now as we enter into chapter 12? Uh, in chapter 12, we see that the assembly of Israel had come together at Gilgal. At Gilgal. Uh, it had marked the, this as an important milestone in, uh, in the Israelite history. Uh, and consequently, 1 uh, Samuel chapter 12 really is a turning point. Uh, it's a turning point chapter in, in biblical history. Uh, when you look at this, this assembly of, of Israelites that had come together, they ratified the work of, of, of really of the Mizpah um, assembly, and they finally closed the period of judges. And so that 300 and some year uh, period uh, is now closed. And now uh, there's a new period uh, in one in which they inaugurated the, the beginning of the monarchy. Uh, and this period had begun uh, under Samuel and under, uh, and under King Saul. And so when you think about Samuel and, and, and uh, really what his role was uh, as priest, prophet, and judge, we're going to see that he's going to continue on um, uh, during this time, during this reign of, of King Saul as a prophet. And as one that will speak for God. And so even though uh, Samuel is going to retain his influence and his authority as a prophet, Samuel officially ended his rule over Israel. And he knew that it was time for him to take a back seat to King Saul. And so he closes out his judgeship in favor of King Saul and, his, and the newly anointed king uh, that was anointed by God and chosen by the people. And so it was at that time that Samuel, he, he delivers kind of a, a somber address to the people, if you will. And so really, when you look at chapter 12, the bulk of this chapter uh, in verses uh, really 6 through 15, as well as 20 through 25, it really reads more like a sermon uh, almost. And so it kind of resembles in many respects what was written um, in Judges, uh, going all the way back to Judges chapter 2 uh, in, in the period of uh, the period of the judges that began after the death of Joshua. And so it kind of reads, uh, chapter 12 reads much like Judges chapter 2 uh, at Joshua's end. And here we see, even though Samuel hasn't died, uh, but he has to take a back seat to the new, newly anointed king. And so these passages that we get to in chapter 12, uh, one at the beginning, one at the end, they serve to really truly explain uh, what happened in the period of the judges uh, from a theological perspective. Uh, when you think about uh, Samuel, Samuel reminds Israel uh, that he carried out his judgeship in righteousness. He also calls out Israel because of the sin uh, that Israel had in their presence, uh, the sin of idolatry, uh, the sin of greed, the sin of, uh, of unfaithfulness. Um, and so really, when you think about uh, uh, Samuel, he, he calls Israel out for the sin of rejecting God uh, as their king and, and asking for a, a man to be their king, a man to be in charge over God. And so the, the people of Israel, they eventually, uh, they ask, uh, ask him to pray on their behalf. And we're going to look at that here in a second. But we also know that Samuel, uh, he confirms that God will continue to provide for his people Israel if, and this is the key word, God will continue to provide for his people Israel, we learn in this chapter, chapter 12, if they will put away their idols, if they will turn away from sin. You know, brothers and sisters, when you look at uh, this chapter 12, you look at um, this, uh, the newly uh, uh, inaugurated monarchy, the, 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 the newly anointed king, and, and we see that Samuel, as a God's prophet, is telling them that they must turn away from the idols. They must turn away from their sin. Is that really any different than what we have to do in Christianity? I mean, you fast forward thousands of years and you think about uh, what's expected of us. You know, what did they have to turn away from? Idols. What is another term for idols? Sin. They had to turn away from greed. They had to turn, oh, turn away from unfaithfulness. So and what are another term for those things? Sin. You know, they had to turn away from jealousy and anger, and they had to turn away from uh, just uh, immorality of all various types. And what is that another term for? Sin. And so you think about all the things that we have to turn away from in our lives. We have to turn away from being 
uh, people who are uh, unmerciful. We have to turn away from being people who are unforgiving. We got to turn away from uh, being the type of people who are greedy uh, and self-centered. We have to turn away from being people, um, you know, who who maybe not have idols like they would have had in the Old Testament uh, that they worshipped. But we have things in our lives that we make into idolatry, um, and that's just as sinful and just as damning as as what they would have had thousands of years prior to us. And so, brethren, we see that uh, you could really look at what Samuel is telling to the people of Israel here, that they have to turn away from their idols. They have to turn away from the sin in their lives. They have to repent, uh, and God will hear them. God will still be with them. God will still provide for them, and that is no different than what we have here in the 21st century. We have to turn away from sin. We have to repent. We have to bear uh, bear, uh, fruit unto repentance, uh, and meaning that uh, it's not just words, but uh, our repentance should show up in our deeds and our in our actions. We should uh, people should be able to see the differences in our lives, uh, the differences of how we used to live versus how we are called to live by God and how we choose to live now uh, that we are children of God. And so when you look at you know First Samuel, you look at chapter twelve uh, and what Samuel the prophet is saying here uh, to the people of Israel during this uh, this really this turning point chapter in their history of Israel. It's no different really than what we have to deal with here in the 21st century as Christians. And so brethren, open your Bibles uh, also to 1 Samuel chapter 12. I'll also have it on the uh, the screen for those of you who'd rather see it. Um, Actually, no, I won't have this on the screen because the slide's a little bit too long. So if you open up your Bibles uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 12, let's look at verse 19 through 25. I'll give you a second to turn there. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 19 through 25. Notice what it says. It tells us in uh, that chapter. Then all the people said to Samuel, Samuel, pray for your servants. Pray for your servants to the Lord your God so that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil by asking uh, for ourselves a king. Samuel said to the people, do not fear. You have committed all this evil. And yet, and yet, do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. You must not turn aside, for then you would go after futile things, which cannot provide, uh, or, or which you cannot profit or deliver, because they are futile. For the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it for me that I would sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and the right way. And it goes on to say, only fear the Lord and serve him uh, in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things that he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, both you and your king uh, will be swept away. You know, I read this, uh, what we learn here and what the prophet Samuel is telling the people of, uh, uh, of Israel in chapter 12 and verse 19 through 25. And it really makes me think of really... Um, uh, Romans, uh, the, the opening uh, couple chapters of Romans and, and what we see there. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, notice what it says in verse 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Well, it's not just belief. Remember, what is biblical faith? It's belief, it's trust, and it's uh, obedience working in harmony together. And so it says, um, uh, God for uh, it says for, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written but the righteous man shall live by faith notice what it says the righteous man shall live by faith faith is belief it's trust in the promises of God and it's being obedient to God what do we see here that the that the prophet Samuel is telling the people of Israel it says for the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name because the Lord is pleased to make you a people for himself moreover as for me far be it for me that I, the, that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you but I will instruct you in the good and right way brethren you see what God, uh, what Samuel is telling the people here. Uh, it says actually, even in verse 20, it says, do not fear. You have committed all this evil and yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but we are to serve the Lord with all our heart. He's telling the people of Israel. It's no different than the New Testament times. As Christians, we are to love the Lord, our God, with all our hearts, with all our mind, with all our soul. We are to serve the Lord, our God in that capacity. Uh, with a sacrificial type of love and service to the kingdom, just as Christ Jesus had for his creation, his people. 
And so we see, uh, brethren, that that we are to to uh, not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, like we uh, like we learn in Romans chapter one. And we know here in uh, in in First Samuel chapter twelve that the people of Israel uh, they shouldn't be ashamed of of really the law of Moses, or they shouldn't be ashamed of being called children of God. And so that's why they recognized in the very beginning uh, verse there in verse nineteen, he, he they're asking Samuel to pray for them because they realized the sin that they committed by asking for a man to rule over them instead of having God to be their commander in chief, to having God be their king over them. And so they realize uh, when they when Samuel brings us to their attention, they're pricked in the heart. And so as we continue on here, uh, once again, we see that God, you know, he reconfirms uh, his continued commitment to Israel as long as they will turn away from the sin in their lives uh, and turn back to, to serving him uh, with, a, with a spirit like Samuel, a spirit of righteousness, a spirit of obedience. And so that they needed to have a, a commitment that was really forged and based in obedience um, and always be, and, and it needed to always be that way. Uh, just as it is for all mankind. You go back and you look at the patriarchal period, you go back, you look at the mosaic period, the Christian period, and, and what, is the, what is the one uh, common denominator? That God demands obedience. He, demand, he demands obedience to his word. And so in what happens in all three dispensations, what do we see in, in the patriarchal era? What do we see uh, with uh, during the time of Noah uh, and, and, and the ark? We see that God had caused, um, God had seen that, 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 that the, the hearts of mankind was evil all the time. And so he was, uh, he, was, he was saddened that he even created us and that he made us. And so he allowed a flood to come upon the earth and destroy all the people on the planet except for eight individuals who got into that boat. And so what do we see? Why did that happen? Because of disobedience. God had given instruction and they were living lives that were contrary to that instruction. Then we get to the Mosaic period. God rescues uh, Israel. He saves them, brings them up out of Egypt by the hand. Um, and his power is working uh, in and through them. They could see the great power of God working through them, uh, protecting them, providing for them, guiding them in the night and guiding them by the day. And yet what do they do? They turn away from God and, and and living lives of, of, of disobedience. And so what God allowed the oppressed, uh, allowed to lose their because of their constant grumbling and complaining and disobedience to the word of God. What do we see in the New Testament? We know that it, uh, when Jesus returns uh, in flaming fire, it tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, that Jesus is going to take uh, um, vengeance on two groups of people, those who are not obedient and those who do not know Christ. And so, brethren, we see that there's a common denominator, no matter what uh, period or what era that you study, God expects obedience. And when God does not get obedience from his creation, there are consequences. And so brethren, we need to understand uh, that that is uh, that has been that way since the beginning of time, and it'll be that way until Christ returns. Uh, when we think about Samuel, uh, Samuel, he'll continue to offer his guidance as we learn there in, uh, uh, at the end of uh, verse 24 and 25 there of chapter 12. He's going to continue to offer his guidance and, and, uh, and his righteous work uh, on behalf of God as a prophet of God. Samuel backs up his message and he confirms that, uh, that he still is God's prophet. And, he, and what I mean by that is in chapter 12, we see that he provides evidence that he is still uh, God's prophet and that he is still pleasing in God's sight because he tells them that he's going to, uh, he's going to pray uh, for a, a thunderstorm to occur, and we see that God miraculously uh, brings about a thunderstorm uh, as, just as he had told Israel in that chapter, and it comes about at that very moment. And so the people of Israel, they all realize that Samuel still walks uh, in the ways of the Lord. They realize what a righteous uh, servant he has always been, even though his sons were not, uh, and they did not walk in his ways. But we know that uh, we know that Samuel was righteous up until all the way to the day he died and serving God in all the various capacities that God had asked him to serve. And so all future prophets, brethren, will have that very same relationship that Samuel had uh, with King Saul, as well as with the priests, that the, the prophets are going to be uh, sort of a, a mediator, if you will. They're going to be mediators and they're going to be guides in moral matters uh, for the kings, as well as to make sure that the priests are doing what they're called to do and what they're supposed to do. And now we get to chapter 13. 
And as we get into 1 Samuel chapter 13, the purpose of uh, really chapters 13 through 15 is to really document the decline of uh, uh, the decline of King Saul and his reign. Um, yes, we know that he, he reigned for 40 years. And when we look at these chapters, we don't really have a, a, a completely accurate timeline as far as what happened when, how quickly some of these things happened. But we know that in chapters 13 through 15, it's a period of about 40 years uh, in which he was, uh, that he served as king. And so these chapters are kind of a prelude to the rest of 1 Samuel, which addresses the really theological issues of how, uh, of how it came to be that kings, that, that Israel's um, uh, trace their kings, not through King Saul, but all future kings in Israel uh, had traced their, their lineage through King David and not King Saul. And so in chapter 13, we see that King Saul, he makes his first mistake. And uh, his first mistake is, uh, is really, um, is that he allowed his success to go to his head. Uh, he allowed his success to go to his head. He allowed pride uh, to enter in, and uh, he, he stopped being as, as humble as he used to be. You see, when they first wanted to make him king, he was hiding, uh, and, 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 and it, it kind of showed his, his heart, it kind of showed his mindset that he had a mindset of humility. But eventually, as he won uh, some of these battles, these early battles uh, in chapters uh, 11 and 12 uh, against the Ammonites, and so... Uh, we see, and then also against uh, the Philistines too coming up, we see that uh, pride starts to set in. And Saul, uh, he, he didn't exactly follow exactly uh, what God had, had, had directed Samuel uh, to, to tell him to do. For example, uh, I told you earlier that the priesthood and the king uh, and the kingship during the monarchy during these years were kept separate. And so it was the job of the priests to, in order to make the sacrifices. And so uh, Samuel told Saul what to do. And he said, when I come, I will make the, I will offer up the sacrifices. But we see because Saul was becoming afraid um, as he's getting to, ready to enter into another battle and that Samuel had not showed up yet that he goes ahead and he decides to do the, the sacrificing himself. And so he allowed fear to dictate his actions as the Philistines were camped against Israel. And so Samuel told him, uh, he told him specifically to wait seven days and that he would instruct Saul as to God's will uh, and he would offer the burnt offerings when he came. And so what do we see? We see that uh, Saul's uh, kind of uh, his uh, self-importance, if you will, his sense of self-importance uh, kind of gets in the way because, like I said, pride and his ego are becoming more and more inflated as time goes by. And so he figured he didn't need a priest to, to offer up the sacrifices, and he takes it upon himself to do these things, uh, and he gets rebuked for doing them. Remember, the role of the king and the role of the priest are to be separate during the monarchy. Uh, never forget, brethren, that God allows Israel to have a fleshly king, but at the end of the day, that, uh, that, uh, that king is still subject to God in all things. The priesthood is still subject to God in all things. And so while they have a king and while they have a priesthood, God is ultimately still in charge and is in charge and always will be. We know that Saul, uh, he, he could have had a long reign. Uh, he, the, the, the crown could have been uh, uh, in his house for, for, an, uh, for an eternity. Uh, we know that the, the kings would have traced their lineage to King Saul instead of King David, all future kings of Israel. But the reason why it doesn't happen is because of his pride, because of his arrogance, because of his disobedience. Uh, and because of his unwillingness to, uh, to trust God and to do things the way that God would have him to do them. And so, brethren, God makes an example. Uh, he makes an example out of Saul because of his disobedience and because of his lack of trust and his lack of faith in God himself. And so many times we see that Saul, he gets himself in trouble when he uh, allows fear to dictate his actions. For example, let's open our Bibles now uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 13. Then we're going to look at verse 8 through 14, and I want you to see what 1 Samuel chapter 13 tells us as we cover verses 8 through 14. We're going to see how Saul is about to be rebuked. It says, starting in verse 8, Now he, Saul, waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from were scattering from, from Saul. And so Saul said, Bring to me the burnt offerings and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offerings. As soon as he finished offering the burnt offerings, behold, Samuel had come. And Saul went out to meet him and to greet him. But Samuel said to him, What is this that you have done? 
And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattering from me, see, fear was entering the picture, and that you did not come within the appointed days, and the Philistines were assembling at, at, at uh, Mich Michmish, uh, at, uh, Michmish. Uh, therefore I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not asked the favor of the Lord. And so I forced myself, and I offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord uh, for now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as a ruler over his people. Because you have not kept the word and you have not kept what the Lord had commanded you. Brother, do you see how very important it is that we live according to the word of God? Do you see how important it is and how important it was during the as, as the first king in, 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 uh, in a long line of kings during this time of monarchy, uh, during, uh, during this uh, new chapter of, of Israelite history? We see that because of disobedience, uh, that God had, had removed um, uh, the crown, is, is going to remove the crown uh, from uh, King Saul and is going to give it to somebody uh, who is uh, who follows after God's own heart. And so, brethren, God, he demanded obedience, as I said, in the patriarchal era. He demanded obedience in the Mosaic era. He demands obedience now in the Christian era. And when God's people are not obedient, then we will have to suffer the consequences of our broken relationship with God. And that's exactly what King Saul is going to have to do because his uh, relationship has been broken uh, with God. And now we get to chapter 14. And in chapter 14, it focuses on a battle that's in the mountainous area of, of Gibeah and Michmash. Um, it must have been earlier on in, in, in the reign of Saul, because in this chapter, Saul is depicted, is, is really truly depicted not so much as wicked, but instead he's depicted as foolish and frustrated. And so King Saul's intentions, even though they were good, even though they were sincere, uh, he pursued them in really truly self-defeating ways because he, he usurped his own authority because he didn't have authority over the priesthood. The priest answered to God and not to the... Uh, uh, and so we see that he was doing things that he ought not to do. And that's why I said earlier, um, you know, when he offered those offerings, uh, sure, his... his um, mindset may have been sincere but we see that he did he did things that were really in self-defeating ways and so um and some of the other things that were self-defeating were the fact that in in this chapter he uh he committed his troops to, to an oath uh and he even pronounces curses upon those who breaks his break break his oath and so he uh it, it told them that, that they weren't allowed to eat well what happens here in this chapter now we see that uh he offers these foolish um uh he, he makes the military take these foolish oaths because god himself had not even asked the people uh to take an oath god himself did not require this so why would he do that and put his army at a disadvantage and so it kind of makes me think of when you go back into our study of judges and you think of uh jephthah jephthah made a foolhearted uh a vow before god and and and, and god uh, never required it of him, but because he made it uh, and he swore to God, he had to do exactly what he said he was going to do. And so Saul does a similar thing by putting the children of Israel uh, under an oath that God did not require of him. And so the only thing that God ever requires of his people is, is plain and simple. God just requires obedience to his commands. If they were be obedient, and as they listen to Samuel, God's prophet, he told them, put away your idols. Put away the sin from your lives, and God will provide for you. God will guide you. He will give you victory in your battles. He will, he will not allow you to be oppressed. And so what does Saul do because of fear? He starts to offer sacrifices, taking away the responsibility of the priest. He starts to, uh, he starts to make decisions based out of fear and not one based out of faith and trust in the promises of God. And so we see that uh, that we see here that that uh, that instead of just being obedient and trusting God and knowing that all things would work out, they allow uh, fear to to dictate their actions. But on the other hand, we have uh, somebody named Jonathan that comes to light in these chapters, and we know that that's King Saul's son. And Jonathan received divine approval, and he also received the praise of both the people 
that was befitting of a king. You see, because Jonathan acted more like a king than his father did uh, in, the, in this battle uh, with the Philistines. And so we see that he trusted in God. Uh, he didn't allow fear to dictate his, uh, his decisions. He knew that with God on his side, there was no amount of Philistines that could stand against him or stand against Israel. And so Jonathan, he had that same type of faith that both Joshua and Caleb had. You remember when uh, Moses sent Joshua and Caleb out with the, uh, as part of the, the, the spies? And uh, Joshua and Caleb came back with, uh, with the 12 spies. They both had a positive report, but the other 10 had a negative report. And so we see that uh, God, uh, God did not, not allow anybody who was 20 years or over uh, that during that time frame to enter into the promised land because the people were fickle. The people didn't trust in God and his promises. But he allowed Jacob, Jake, uh, Joshua and Caleb to enter the promised land because they trusted in God and they brought back a positive report. And we see here that Jonathan and similar light trusted in God and he knew that with God on his side there was nobody that could stand before him or stand before the people of Israel and so now we get to uh, Saul's second mistake as we learn here in this chapter and really his second mistake is that silly order uh, that I mentioned earlier about the army having to abstain from food and really, and his senseless, uh, his senseless death penalty of his son, Jonathan, uh, he was going to kill his son, Jonathan, for breaking this oath. But Jonathan wasn't there when the oath was made, and he didn't even know about the oath. And so Jonathan, when he took honey and he ate to give him energy, uh, he was going to his father was going to pronounce a death uh, penalty on him. But the people of Israel, uh, they knew uh, that, that, that God and his power were with Jonathan uh, when, he, when he gave this victory to really to Israel. And that he didn't violate his conscience. He didn't violate the king's decree. And so the people vehemently stood up and they, uh, and, and, and they protested uh, King Saul's decision to put him to death. And so um, because King Saul was fearful of the people, he decides to backtrack from that. And so Jonathan had put his trust in God and he didn't allow fear to overtake him as his father did and we know that king saul he was still he was still disheartened we know that king saul was still saddened uh, by the previous chapter's uh, pronouncement from uh, from the prophet samuel that god was going to remove the crown from him that he was going to uh, remove it from uh, from his lineage and from his family line and that's uh and that he was going to uh, crown somebody um, in the future, he was going to anoint somebody king who was after his own heart. And so what do we see? Luckily for Israel, Jonathan was a righteous man in chapter 14. He was a righteous man. He was a God-fearing man and a God, uh, a, a, a wonderful servant uh, in the kingdom, uh, well, in, in the Israeli, Israelite kingdom. And he goes on to be a wonderful friend uh, to, to the next king, uh, the anointed king, and that'll be King David. And so brethren, we're going to end. We don't have any, uh, into chapter 16 and 16 pick up in next week, continue our journey through uh for through first samuel and remember this isn't meant to be an in-depth study it's just a high level overview so we can have an understanding really a quicker understanding of, of what these books are, uh, why they were written, what, what are the, the, the main things that we could uh, ascertain from this information, and how it affected uh, the, the, really the history of the Israelites. Uh, and then also, too, in, in to see how um, eventually you're going to see, as the literary prophets uh, come on the scene, uh, where God prophesied, uh, you know, 60 major uh, prophecies that the, that the Messiah was going to fulfill uh, in his life. And so we'll talk more about that as we move forward into, the, into these studies. So I hope this, uh, this study was, uh, uh, good, was good for you for this evening. Uh, if you have any questions on the information or if you ever have any questions, please feel free to call me, text me, email me, whatever is uh, easiest for you. And I'd love to answer those questions for you. Let's go to God in prayer as we shut the lesson down for the night. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to gather together using uh, the, this technology that you have given us uh, to, to study the Bible uh, and to continue to come together, even though there's a time and, and distance between us, we still come together uh, here in, uh, in the middle of the week to study your word as the local congregation and as a body of believers. And I just pray, Father God, that everything that we do, uh, we can look to this information and we can ask ourselves, Father, you know, how can we apply this to our, to our, our walk here in the 
the 21st century? How can we apply this to our Christian faith to see how your people uh, acted and reacted in the Old Testament and how we are to act and react in the New Testament? I pray, Father God, for all of us to have the wisdom that we need uh, in the discernment of the scriptures in order to uh, be pleasing in your sights. My God and my Father, we pray for that we have many people on our prayer list at the Lincoln Park Congregation, and we pray, Father God, uh, that you be with each of them and you bless them as they would have need, for I know we have many various needs, whether it be physical, emotional, spiritual, and even financial, and so, Father, we ask blessings on each as you would have need, as they would have need, and we know that you know all things before we ask. Father God, we pray for our country. We pray for the leadership of this country uh, in this new administration. We pray for them to uh, come to the knowledge of the truth of your word, so as they make decisions decisions, that they're decisions that align with uh, your standards and your ways. And, and, and I just pray that uh, as, as the administration makes these decisions, uh, they come to understand uh, what you call right and what you call wrong and how it is many times vastly different than what, what we as mankind would call right and wrong. We pray, Father God, for our military. We pray for them, that you, that you protect them, uh, that you watch over them, uh, and you allow each of them to do their jobs and their, their duties to the best of their ability, and that they can uh, go home safely each and every night. We pray for our first responders uh, who protect our communities uh, locally, uh, and we just pray, Father God, for all of our medical uh, personnel uh, who are fighting tirelessly and have been for quite some time now during this pandemic, uh, and, and, and just truly serving uh, their communities and, and, and with a spirit of, uh, of compassion, uh, and mercy. And so, Father, we just pray blessings on all involved. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you and ask you for all things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, brethren. I hope this message, I uh, hope this uh, study you, you found well tonight, and we look forward to seeing you next time.